absolute ruler of North Korea, is potentially the most dangerous man in power today. The man behind a virulent campaign of propaganda against the United States, Kim now claims to possess nuclear weapons and says he will use them if his regime is threatened. He rules over the most isolated nation on Earth, a country the size of Mississippi, population 22 million. For years, he remained a hidden and mysterious figure. Now he has taken center stage. Yet his true intentions and nature are still open to debate. He was portrayed as basically a very weird kind of person that you had no idea what he was going to be like. But when I met him, he was actually quite charming. He may not have a balanced personality. Sometimes he's very, very reckless, and sometimes he's very calm. But he's quite bright and almost brilliant in his thinking. He's nobody's fool, but he's apparently a very quixotic, compulsive, rather rash man. That aspect of him is worrisome in a leader who's going to have his finger on a nuclear trigger, maybe. The full extent of Kim's nuclear capability is still unclear. But if he actually possesses atomic weapons or the materials to make them, the threat reaches well beyond the region. North Korea is ready to sell nuclear missile, nuclear weapons to any buyer at a reasonable prices. You can't stop a handful of plutonium, which is all it takes to make a bomb, a sort of grapefruit-sized lump, from getting out of North Korea. One of the things I fear about a nuclear North Korea is that it will sell plutonium to the likes of Osama bin Laden. The reality of nuclear weapons in North Korea could also lead to a perilous new arms race. Immediately, Japan will go nuclear. Then you have China will be alarmed. So no time will you have Sino-Japanese arms race. These are huge countries. By all standards, the situation in Korea is difficult. The options limited. While the Bush administration does not rule out military action, the consequences of a second Korean War could be catastrophic. The North Korean military is the fifth largest military in the world. It has over 1.2 million in uniform and has the ability to mobilize two to three million more. They have the largest submarine fleet in the world. They don't view using chemical weapons as a weapons of mass destruction. They see it as part of their normal doctrine. Even without their use of missiles and unconventional weapons, an attack on North Korea could result in a devastating retaliation. Thousands of artillery rockets hidden in the hills just north of the border could reach South Korea's capital, Seoul, only 30 miles away in under three minutes. In 1994, the North Koreans said if uh, anyone thinks they'll be contemplating an attack on North Korea, we can turn Seoul into a sea of fire. There's no bigger threat than that. There are 12 million people in Seoul. South Korea can be reached by conventional cannon, not missiles, not the uh, nuclear bomb. Since the invasion of Iraq, North Korean officials fear that they will be the next target of U.S. forces. But a crucial element of the American military strategy in Iraq was the expectation of support of the local population. In North Korea, this possibility is highly unlikely. What happened in Baghdad will not happen in North Korea. North Koreans are, are very well indoctrinated. Despite the enormity of their suffering over the last decade, that included a widespread famine in which more than a million people starved to death, the vast majority of North Koreans do not appear to hate their leader. The level of popularity enjoyed by Kim Jong-il is unquestionable. 
there is no divisiveness within the system. There is no dissension or dissident groups. It would be very difficult for us to uh, replace the regime. Then replace with what? Kim Jong-il has survived into the 21st century, while other old-style communist regimes are long gone. But since its inception, North Korea has always been unique among totalitarian socialist societies. What makes it different, and a key factor in Kim's survival, is his cynical exploitation of deeply rooted cultural traditions to manipulate and control the minds and hearts of his people. The North Korean system that seems so strange to outsiders makes a lot of sense to Koreans because it fits in very well with their traditional worldview, with the history they've come out of and these notions of social hierarchy, reverence for the leader. Those are all things that are, are reinforced by this cultural identity. To understand how Kim has succeeded in capitalizing on this age-old cultural identity, we must look to the history of the proud and determined people of Korea. For 1,300 years, Korea was a thriving and highly advanced civilization, living in relative peace as an independent and unified nation. But Korea's unique position in the geography of the region made it a tempting target. As the 20th century approached, Japan invaded the peninsula with the intention of conquering the mainland. Instead, they took Korea. Korea remained a colony of Japan for 35 years. Koreans were given Japanese names. The speaking of Korean was discouraged. The eating of Korean food was derided. And when they were crossed, uh, the Japanese could be very brutal. The Japanese forced tens of thousands of young Korean women to work as sexual slaves, essentially, for the Japanese military, the so-called comfort women, as well as mobilizing hundreds of thousands of Koreans for forced labor in Japanese mines and factories. They imprisoned and killed thousands of Koreans who resisted. It was a policy of cultural obliteration of Korea's independent identity. Japan is finished as a major world power. Japan's dream of empire finally ended with their defeat in World War II. For the first time in over 50 years, Koreans saw hope for their freedom and fully expected to once again become a peaceful, independent nation. But while the United States had extensive plans for post-war Japan, it was almost totally unprepared for what to do with Korea. But Russia was prepared. Just prior to Japan's surrender, Soviet troops swept south deep into Korea. The US had no forces in place to prevent them from occupying the entire peninsula and was frantic for a solution. On August 10th, 1945, there was a meeting of senior leaders of the US government. Around midnight, they sent two colonels, one of whom was Dean Rusk, our future Secretary of State, into another room with instructions to draw a line across the Korean Peninsula where the United States would divide occupation duties with the Soviet Union. Mr. Rusk said in his memoirs that he had no preparation for this task and all he had was a National Geographic map there was nothing on the map to indicate a natural boundary. So they simply drew a line approximately halfway down the peninsula at the 38th parallel, just north of the capital, Seoul. In the years that followed, this arbitrary border hardened into a barrier, separating families and loved ones from each other. This was a disastrous decision. The Koreans had no input on the country being divided. They were bitterly opposed to this. No Koreans accepted this dividing line as anything permanent, and most wanted to get rid of that line at, at any cost. One man determined to reunify Korea at any cost is Kim Il-sung, 
the legendary father of Kim Jong-il. Chosen by Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin to lead North Korea, he will become like a god to his people. But his dream of reunifying his country will result in a devastating catastrophe. Kim Il-sung's unique position among communist dictators after World War II is rooted in his fierce independence and defiant spirit. He begins his career as a guerrilla fighter against the hated Japanese. Kim wasn't just a Soviet stooge like some of the people that Stalin was putting into power in Eastern Europe. He was a genuine nationalist that the Koreans could respect as someone who really spent his whole life up to that point fighting the Japanese. And he did seem to have a certain charisma. The legends of his daring do, of course, were very much used. And the cult of personality uh, immediately uh, began to be put in place and has continued to this day. The systematic development of Kim's cult of personality depends primarily on a ceaseless campaign of propaganda. It seems as if Kim Il-sung was the sole independence fighter against the Japanese. That Kim Il-sung is a military genius. That's how children are taught. We were told that he crossed the river on a bridge of leaves. And then he threw pine cones, and they turned into grenades. We heard this over and over, and we really believed that. So, naturally, we idolized him. The idolization of Kim Il-sung goes beyond the usual barrage of half-truths and hyperbole. Kim enhances his godlike image by exploiting long-held cultural traditions rooted in Confucianism. He developed an ideology called the Juche, that is self-reliance, which is based on Confucian civilization. It's Confucian civilization in the sense that you have the family system and the state is an extended version of the family and therefore the leader is a father. And North Koreans think that way about their leadership. The leadership they support because they're the parents. And they don't choose their parents. They're simply there. That's what underlies the Juche ideology. Juche uses the kind of organic metaphor of the whole society, the state, as a single body, with the head being the leadership and the people being the, the, the main body of, of the society, and that you can't have one without the other. People have to move as one entity. Unlike Marxist Leninist ideology, this is more spiritual determinism-based doctrine, which is Confucianism. When you have the will, you can move the mountains. On June 25, 1950, Kim Il-sung launches a massive invasion of South Korea. In Northeast Asia, the latest hotspot in the Cold War. Almost all analysts in the United States thought that it was Joseph Stalin who told Kim Il-sung to 